I'm at a disadvantage. I grew up in Greenleaf, Idaho, and I lived a half mile away from school. So I never had a chance to ride a bus. So that's why I'm at a disadvantage speaking with you today. However, I reached out to a number of friends and I asked them to share with me some specific stories about growing up and the impact, the positive influence of a bus driver on their lives. And the stories came flooding in. So over the course of our brief time this morning, I'm going to share some of what those folks said about the influence of bus drivers on their lives. Bill Rauer wrote to me, he said, my bus driver from fourth through sixth grades, Mr. Dana Morrill, never let his passengers see he was having a bad day and saw to it our day was a little better for having been with him. Even when he had to get out the pine scent sawdust to cover up the product of a car sick passenger, he did so with a smile. I and my friends actually looked forward to riding the bus and many of us gave him gifts at Christmas. He must have had a positive influence on me. Listen to this. I remember his name 40 years later. There's only one thing I want you to take away from our time together today, and that is every single thing you do matters. Everything you do matters. So we're going to start off with a little exercise Look around you, and I need you to uh, not move a lot, but you're going to form up into groups of four to five people, and you need to have at least one woman in your group. So go ahead. Together, groups of four to five people. You can have a little more. At least one woman in the group. Thank you, Brad. Okay, we'll see the leaders in the group, those that formed up the fastest. Thank you very much. All right, here's the exercise. This is ripped from the headlines. So this is something that actually happens over in Quantico, Virginia. The Marines do a training for business people, and we're going to do a portion of that training right here today. It's on ethics, but ultimately it's going to show you that every single thing you do matters. Here's the training. They bring a group of people together. They're not military, but they treat them like they are military. These people are supposed to pretend that they are in the Middle East, and they are given assignments each and every day. Our assignment today, as this group, is our assignment. We have been tasked with going into the mountainous region, identifying basically a tribe in the Middle East. We're going to go in. We're going to meet with the tribal elder, and we're going to start building a positive relationship with this group of people. That's our task. So we are, we're awake at 3 o'clock in the morning. Some of you have to get up really early for that bus route. How many heard that Al Roker slept in this morning and he missed his first show? It happens to the best of us. But this morning, for purposes of our training, we are awake at 3 a.m. and we go hiking into the mountains, pitch black. Now, the sun starts to rise and we come over the top of a hill. And there in the bottom, we see a camp. And in the camp, you can see there's a campfire going and smoke is wafting up and the people are gathered together in that camp. And as we walk down, you and your small group, and you're military now, you've been drafted, we walk down into this and we see that there's a bit of a commotion. Everybody looks happy except for the woman who is in the center of the group of people, and her hands are tied up. This is true. This actually happens. It's training that we are, go through as business people. So, as you approach, the woman notices you. She breaks free from the group, and she runs up to your group, hands bound, and she runs to the woman in your group, and in her, form, in her language, she's saying, please, please help me. You quickly figure out that you have walked in on an arranged marriage. Your leader tells you you have a decision to make. You're fully armed, you've got backup, you've got extraction teams waiting at the call. 
you're safe. You have a decision to make. Are you going to carry out the mission and build relations with the tribal elder who is now right there in your face saying, you let her go. This is part of our culture. You don't understand what's going on. Back away. Do you listen to the tribal elder or do you intervene? Do you protect the woman whose hands are bound and is pleading for you to help her? This is the assignment. Your leader right there in the mountains has told you you've got a decision to make and you have less than 30 seconds to make it in your group. Go to it. What are you going to do? Thanks for recording this. All right, 10 seconds left. What are you going to do? All right. Somebody shoot their hand up who's really brave and tell me. Or, or let's do this. We've got a big room. So. All of you who said, we're going to give the woman back to the group, we're going to stand back, and then we'll develop the relationships with the, with the tribe after they're through with the arranged marriage, raise your hand. All right. Those of you who said, we're going to intervene, we're going to save the woman, raise your hand. Okay. So, this, this really happens. Now, a majority, I'll let you know, a majority of the people who go through this training, they go with option number one. They usually say, we're going to stand back. It's part of the culture. There's nothing we can do. So here, I'm going to read to you some of the results and some of what folks have said about this training immediately afterwards because it really drives home our point today. One person said, we tried to prevent it, but it, what, we could try to prevent it, but to what end? I didn't feel it was our place to stop an arranged marriage. So the Marine stepped in, who was leading this exercise, and asked the question. So what happened as, as a result of that decision of doing nothing? The participant said it in three words. She was raped. The other students pointed out that they were powerless to change a culture that believes in forced marriage, and even if they stopped this one incident, it's not going to change the culture that allows it. Remembering everything you do matters. Here's what the Marine said in response to that statement. But this is the first time you had an opportunity to do something about it. This is the first time you had an opportunity to do something about it. That's pretty powerful when you think about every single situation you're presented with on a daily basis, driving that bus. The impact you have, because every single thing you do matters. Another response to my question about those bus drivers who had positive influences on kids, Wendy Hafer wrote to me, she said, in kindergarten, I missed my bus stop to get off. First week riding the bus, she was so sweet. I was scared to death. She asked where I lived. I didn't know. She redrove her route till I knew. She said, and I never forgot this. I never forgot this. She said, there is always a solution to a problem as long as we stay calm. It'll be all right, and I will make sure you get home safe. She was right. This is an adult probably in her 30s or 40s, who remembers that one instance. How many times have you all done something that seems that small and insignificant? It's remembered. Every single thing you do matters. So now I want all of you to pull out your driver's license. Go ahead, pull out your driver's license. This is interactive. Who knew you are going to be working at 8 o'clock in the morning? 
making decisions, life-changing decisions. So if you'll pull out that driver's license, and as soon as you get it out, hold it up in the air. Okay, you all have something unique on your driver's license I don't have, right? It's a CDL, correct? In order to drive a bus. I don't have a CDL. I think that's something that you have worked for, but it only gives you a license to drive a bus. It's a license to drive. So my question to you today, as you consider this statement that everything you do matters, you have a license to drive, but do you want a license to lead? You have a license to drive, but do you really want a license to lead? To leave a lasting impact on those kids' lives, just like we've been hearing about and will continue to hear about throughout the course of our short time today. That's the question I think we all have to ask ourselves as we go day in and day out thinking about how everything we do really does matter. So I want to tell you the story of Ed Lorenz. Ed Lorenz is, was a mathematician and a meteorologist, smart guy. And back in 1963, he had to write a doctoral thesis. And Ed Lorenz had this crazy idea he said, what if a butterfly flapping its wings would start moving molecules of air, and those molecules of air would start bouncing and bouncing, and actually would carry on that process, molecule to molecule to molecule to molecule, and create a storm somewhere else in the world? It was a theory back in 1963. He presented it on a big stage like this in New York, and he was basically laughed off the stage. He called it the butterfly effect. You've probably heard about it. It caught people's attention. Movies were made, books were written, people talked about this concept, this theory of a butterfly effect. And then a group of scientists and researchers got together in the mid-1990s and they said, let's take a closer look at this concept of the butterfly effect and what Ed Lorenz wrote about all the way back in 1963. So they dove into it and they researched and they tested and they tested and they found out that with every piece of living matter, no matter what, Ed Lorenz's theory worked. And what was first introduced as simply the butterfly effect back in 1963 became the law of sensitive dependence on initial conditions in the mid-1990s. The law of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Meaning you're going to create some initial conditions that carry on. You all have a butterfly effect because every single thing you do matters. There's a terrific example of this. George Washington Carver. He was born in the late 1800s and basically born into a slave family. His mother was kidnapped he was left for dead with a farm family in Missouri who rescued him. He grew up to have this love for agriculture. He was at Iowa State University, and because of racial segregation, was not allowed to live in the dorms. So a family took him in. And as this family took him in, it was the Wallace family. The Wallace family invited George Washington Carver to spend Saturday afternoons with their then six-year-old little boy on horticultural expeditions. And so George Washington Carver, this 19-year-old college student, would go out and spend his Saturday afternoons with this little six-year-old boy, and they would go around and they would look at plants and they would talk about the power of plants and what you could do with plants and how you could feed people. 
And then George Carver went on to live his life. In the course of living his life, he created 266 different uses for the peanut and 88 different uses for the sweet potato. I guarantee you, if you've eaten a meal in the last 12 hours, George Washington Carver has had, had an impact on your life. He did some big things. In the grand scope of things, those couple hours that he spent with little Henry Wallace on Saturday afternoons really didn't mean a lot until you start looking at what Henry Wallace did. Henry Wallace became vice president of the United States. And in, that, in that office, he had a level of power and authority, and he set up a research station in Mexico. His goal with that research statement was to hybridize corn and wheat for arid climates. He hired a guy by the name of Norman Borlaug to work in Mexico with this specific goal because he had a vision that you could feed more people. So a couple of Saturdays a month with George Washington Carver, a family led to this intense interest in agriculture and a bigger picture of what could happen in the world, which led to a research station in Mexico and a guy named Norman Borlaug. And now, because Norman Borlaug was successful in what he did, Norman Borlaug is credited with saving the lives of over two billion, with a B, billion people because he figured out how to create corn and wheat that grows in arid climates, little water. You're coming in contact and you're spending brief moments of time with kids on a school bus every day. You're the first person they see oftentimes in their, as their school day starts, and you're the last person they see. And while it might seem insignificant, just like it probably seems so insignificant to George Washington Carver, what you do matters so much. So as you look at that license, which is a CDL, do you want a license to drive, or do you want a license to lead Understanding that every single thing you do matters. Like I said, I'm a farm kid from Greenleaf, Idaho. And so I like things simple. I remember, I remember my dad waking me up at 4.30 in the morning, and we'd go to spray. Ultimately, it was a big job. Acres and acres and acres. But he would give me a few small things that had to be done and had to be done well in order to get the big job done. And so I'd like to spend some time, just three simple things you can do if you really want to take that license to drive and turn it into a license to lead. Number one on that list, you are Brown Bus Company. This was really brought to my attention. I used to work in the mayor's office in Nampa, and I heard the mayor talk to folks who worked in the city, and he said, you know what? When somebody walks in off the street and comes to us looking for a service, you, the person behind the counter delivering the service, you're the mayor. You're the face of the city to that one person. And that stuck in my head. It's what I tell the employees at Better Business Bureau. It's not Dale Dixon, it is you. You're the one interacting as over 3,000 people come to us each and every month looking for help and making wise buying decisions. We help people buy wisely, companies sell ethically, and we have over 3,000 interactions a month. Well, to that person, that one person calling in the BBB employee who answers the phone, who meets them at the counter, who interacts with them online, they are the CEO of Better Business Bureau to that person. You are the CEO of Brown Bus Company to each and every one of those people who walk onto your bus day in and day out. 
So step number one in really achieving a license to lead in your role is to realize you're Brown Bus Company. You're the face. When somebody pulls up next to you at an intersection and they look up into your bus and they see Brown Bus Company on the side, guess what? You represent Brown Bus Company. They don't see the Carpenter Brothers. They don't see your immediate managers. They see you. You are Brown Bus Company. Step number two. Eye contact and a smile for every single student. Brent talked about this is a time of new beginnings, and I tell you what, you can walk on to the job the first day, and you can say to yourself, today I will make eye contact and smile at every person who walks on my bus. That simple act alone, when you consider that every single thing you do matters, that could be the first act of kindness that person sees in the day. It could mean a lot. It does mean a lot. Listen to this. Robin Wiley wrote me, Elmer was my bus driver on bus number three. Robin is in her, she would probably kill me for saying this, she's at least in her late 40s, mid-50s. Elmer was my bus driver on bus number three, all through middle and high school. He knew every kid's name, always had a friendly face. He never raised his voice to us and always had the kids on the bus under control in a positive way. I'd say that was a positive influence. Your eye contact and a simple smile. It's easy. You think it doesn't matter? It matters. We know what interracial, interrelational science and research shows. If I smile at you genuinely, you're going to smile back at me. We just know that to be true. Think about it. It lifts our spirits. So number one, you are Brown Bus Company. Number two, it's just as simple as eye contact and a smile. And number three, this is where it's going to get a little more difficult but where what you do really does matter. And I got this idea. I need to come down on the floor with you. I got this idea because I'm dad to now a 13-year-old boy, and I'm dad to a 10-year-old girl. And there is no instruction book on parenting. You all know that. But I am trying my best to be the best dad I can be. And I made this discovery that boys and girls are really different. <laughs> and while the difference can be boiled down into what boys need from adults and what girls need from adults, this is where your third step comes into play. It's what I learned about boys and girls, the difference, and the impact that we can have on them as adults. Boys want to know they have what it takes. Boys want to know they have what it takes. So as you interact with those boys on your bus, be looking for ways to communicate to them, you know what, you have what it takes. I've seen you sit there quietly and really set an example. I know you've got what it takes to keep doing that. Find the positive. Reinforce in those boys, I know you have what it takes. I know you're going to a track meet this afternoon. You know what? You've got what it takes to win that race. You might be the only adult in that boy's life to say something like that. Girls... Girls want to know they're unique and they're special. If my daughter, Chloe, gets on your school bus, more than likely you would see her with mismatched socks. She likes to wear bright socks, and she will come up in the morning, and she'll have one bright orange sock and one bright green sock. And I see that as an opportunity 
to recognize that she is unique and special. Chloe, I love your style. You look great today. To us as adults, it looks silly, feels kind of silly. To her, she's a girl. She wants to know she's unique and special. And as adults, when we have an opportunity to feed into the lives of our kids like that, you make a difference. You end up with the story that I'll, I'll leave you with today that was given to me by Kendra Waitley last night. Mr. Gilbert was my bus driver from second through fifth grade. Now remember, this is from a girl's perspective. So understanding that boys want to know they have what it takes and girls want to know that they're special. Listen to what she writes. He made everyone who walked on his bus feel like we were the most important person in the world. He knew about our lives and families and asked about them each day. Mr. Gilbert was firm and stern, but so kind and gentle at the same time. If we were up and talking and running around, he'd stop the bus and come back and say, Now you know, your parents rely on me to get you to and from school safe every day. And when you're up and running around like that, you're not making my job easy. I'm sure there were times when I thought he was the meanest person in the world. But looking back, I know that he did it out of care and concern. I remember when I graduated from the fifth grade on my last day of school, he told me, good luck, be a good kid, and don't worry, I'll take care of Kyra, which was her little sister at the time. I'll see Mr. Gilbert around town from time to time, and every time I see him, it puts a smile on my face. He was a constant in my life, and it's amazing how someone can have an influence on you even though you may not realize it at the time. Need I say, everything you do matters. Mr. Gilbert was a wonderful, caring man who saw it as his responsibility to take care of all 35-plus kids who rode that bus each day. He did that out of genuine love and concern, and I thank him for being the smiling face I saw each morning and afternoon. So to Mr. Gilbert, thank you for taking care of us and putting up with us, and most of all, for making sure we got to school safe each day and allowing us the opportunity to learn and become the people we are today. His influence was as important as any teacher because without him, we would not have been there. Most of all, to Mr. Gilbert, I want to say thank you for being one of the kindest people I've ever known. Your influence will not soon be forgotten. The kids who ride your buses can say the same exact thing about you 15 years from now, 20 years from now, 40 years from now. You talk about a butterfly effect. You have an, an amazing opportunity. So if you really want to take that CDL and turn it in to a license to lead, stand up with me and raise it up in the air. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Stand up with me, raise it in the air. You've been sitting now for 20 minutes. This is it. Everybody's up, license is out. And we're home. sorry, now I have your attention. I knew that was going to happen. Now we have your attention, license is up. I repeat after me, I have an amazing opportunity to lead this year. I am Brown Bus Company. I will smile and make eye contact with those students when they get on my bus. And I will recognize Boys want to know what, what they have what it takes. Girls want to know they are unique and special. And I will seize the opportunity. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you so much.